If y'all will be here at 7 and help us unload, you won't cool off for a minute. Okay? <laughs> Just kidding. It's so good to have everyone here today. And guys, today we're going we're gonna to cover something that, uh, uh, truthfully, I think all of us struggle with. Just to be quite honest, I've struggled with this before. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a Christian just like you. I, I'm not above anybody. Matter of fact, probably below most people because I, if I keep score about where I'm at in my righteousness before God, I fall away short of the mark all the time. If I compare myself to this gospel, and what Jesus Christ requires of me, I seem to fall short. I do. But today, God asked me to speak on this part about the rich young ruler. And I'm, we're going to go to Mark chapter 10. And, and, and he's given me some, some thoughts about it that we might not have ever really thought about when we read this passage of Scripture. Mark chapter 10, verse number 17. Now, guys, I'm going to read King Jimmy. I, I don't say that King Jimmy's the only kind. I would ask you to make sure that the Bible that you read from does not deny the deity of Christ. And some translations do. So pay attention to that. Verse number 17, it says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him. Now notice the obeisance. In other words, he, he, he comes to Jesus Christ and he kneels. He acknowledges him as someone in a superior place, in, in a place of importance, in a place of uh, power, authority. Do we understand that? This guy recognized Jesus as who he was. Right off the bat, he runs up and he kneels, and then he asks a question, and he asks him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? If we take a moment and we think about that, there's not a single soul in this place that desires to spend their eternity in a devil's hell. As a matter of fact, there are people that are harder to love in this world than others. But even those people that are harder for me to love, that, that literally, guys, they, they cause me so much grief and they, they attack me left and right, I still don't want them in hell. Literally. There may be some spirits working through them that cause me grief, but down deep inside, I want no one to be eternally separated from God, no matter what they've done to me. No one wants to go to that place of eternal punishment. And Jesus said unto him, Why, why callest me thou why callest thou me good? I think those words are already swapped there. <laughs> there is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill, do not steal. Do not bear false witness. De defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. Guys, he, he, he's reminding him of don't fall into the entrapments of the devil. In other words, live a righteous life before God. Amen. The commandments. You know, here's the thing about the Ten Commandments. If you've broken one, you've broken all of them. Many of us don't understand that. If we lie, we bore false witness. We've lied about something. We've dishonored God because we put Satan above God. 
And we've dishonored our, our father and our mother. We, it, the list goes on. We continue to do the wrong thing if we break one. Now, guys, I understand something. There's grace. There's grace. But lots of times, guys, we're not putting up the fight and striving for righteousness before God. We're just existing in a lukewarm state of mind. Lukewarm. I, I went to church. I checked the box. I, I, I learned a memory verse. I checked the box. I gave some offering. I checked the box. Ladies and gentlemen, that kind of, 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 of walk with, with, with God is not a walk with God. It's a walk with the church. Do we understand? It's, it's not a walk with God. It's a walk with the church. It's a walk with requirements that most churches place upon our lives. Tithing. Church can't exist without tithing. Church can't exist without you bringing a Bible. Unless you... It's a different kind of church. Church can't exist without your attendance. Without... A small sacrifice on our part can't exist. But that's not a relationship with God. A relationship with God, ladies and gentlemen, never ends. It never breaks. It doesn't start at 7 a.m. It doesn't end at 9 p.m. It doesn't begin on Sunday morning and it doesn't end on Sunday at midnight. It's a never-ending, beautiful relationship that is the most difficult relationship to walk on the face of the planet. It sounds so simple. But it's not. The Christian life is so challenging to us because, ladies and gentlemen, everything about this life goes against the nature of ourselves. It's easier... To choose the flesh over God. It's harder to choose God over the things that we may enjoy on this side of eternity that may not please God. It's easier. Especially when no one's Look at his response. Verse 20, he said, And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Hey, I've been to church. I went to the synagogue. Jesus, all these things I've been doing since a little boy. I learned Peter, James, and John. And a little sailboat, Peter, James, and John. I learned Jesus loves me this I know. I learned all these, Lord. I learned Zacchaeus in the, in, the, in the sycamore tree. I learned Noah in the ark. I learned Daniel in the lion's den. All these I've kept since my youth. Since I was a little boy. My mom, my dad, they took me and gave me a foundation. That's what they did. Notice the response of our Savior. Then Jesus beholding him, notice the phrase, he loved him. He loved him. He loved him enough to be honest he loved him enough to be honest, honest enough to hurt his feelings. Do we love our brothers and sisters enough to be honest with them and hurt their feelings? Do we care enough about them to say, honestly, 
Brother, you're wrong about this. The Scripture says this. Sister, you're wrong. You're out of line with God. Do we love them enough? To be honest, see, Jesus loved him. Now we understand something here, guys. We need to, this side note right here, we need to take into consideration. Jesus is God in the flesh. So he knew this young man. He knew this young man before he came forth from the womb. He did. He knew this conversation was going to take place before it ever did. He knew that. You know, we're bad to do that. When we know it, <laughs> how many of us actually practice our conversations? Let me tell you something. Any man that has stumbled and knows his wife's going to be mad has practiced all the way home. <laughs> I'm telling you. And any woman that came in and saw that, that her husband saw the thing on the table, where would that come from? She already has rehearsed what she's going to say. <laughs> and it's going to start out something like this. It's going to remind them of that guy named Clarence. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Rehearsal. We do it. It's, it's a nature of ours. But listen, God didn't rehearse. God didn't change. Jesus didn't change what he was going to say. He loved him. He said, there's one thing that you lack. One thing they like is verse 21. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, and notice the phrase, take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved. For he had great possessions. The guys were, that's, that's where we're going to go to. So let's bow in prayer. My dear Heavenly Father, I come before you today, Lord, and I want to praise you for your word. I want to praise you for your word of truth, Lord, that captivates me, that challenges me. Father, I pray, thank you for your Holy Spirit that takes this word and convicts me that I may repent, that I, I may receive fresh wind, a revival in my heart that draws me closer to you, dear Father. Father, to come into the presence of Elohim boldly into the throne room of you, of Abba Father. To come through my mediator, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on Calvary for me. Father, I'm so thankful and privileged and I praise your holy name for calling me out of darkness and into your marvelous life. Father, I thank you for the eternal gift of salvation. Because without it, I wouldn't know in what bondage I was in. And Father, I wouldn't have the opportunity and the power to break every chain. Break every chain so that I may be free from bondage and enjoy my eternal life in you, not only here, but in the days to come. Bless your word today. Bless the reading, the preaching, the teaching, the singing of your word. 
grant us open hearts and ears to hear. In Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, when we read these last two verses of this situation here in 21 and 22, Jesus says, You lack something. Go and sell whatsoever you have and give it to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And then he says, take up your cross and follow me. You see, what happens is that reminds us so much of us in our actual situation, our actual walk today, and our actual state of mind. The actual state of mind of the, of the Christian life today is not one that necessarily is willing to lay all on the altar for God. We've got to the point where we want to give as much to God as we want to give, and that's it. We have boundaries with God. We do. We have boundaries. God, I can't give you this much more because it's going to cost me my life here. We get it? I, I don't want to infringe on my comfort here because I want to be comfortable. I want to draw a line. There's got to be a line here, Father, for me to enjoy my life. So th this is the thing here. I'm going to keep the commandments and I'm going to give you just a little bit of me. I'm not going to give you all of me because if I give you all of me, then I feel like I'll be destitute. I feel like I'll be in want. Father, I've worked for what I got. Father, I went to school for what I got. Father, I've traded and taken risks with my money for what I got. And then we make this really bold, stupid statement that says, what I got, I got on my own. Nobody helped me get it. <laughs> Father, stupid number two, I deserve what I got. I'm not willing to give up what I've got to follow you. Now let's notice the comparison. I'm not willing to give up what I've got to follow you, but Jesus, you're willing to give up what you've got to come save someone that's not worth saving. You see, he picked up his cross and he followed his father to the hill of Golgotha and he died for you and me. And, and, and we take that, we literally take that response, we take that, that act of love and an act of mercy and we tread, we tread it under our feet because why? We're in love with the world, we're not in love with God. We found the comforts of this world and we spend more time spending our time trying to attain and achieve those comforts. That's what we do. I remember when Vicki and I got married. We had nothing. I was tearing down a burnt house in Bryant. It had a chimney and it had a papasan chair frame. Y'all know what I saved? I saved the fireplace and the Papasan chair frame. Why? Because it was better than any chair I had in the house. And Vicki got online, or she didn't get online. We didn't have a line in. It wasn't busy. Man, I just dated myself, didn't I? But we found something in the paper where someone was selling one of the cushions for a Papasan chair. Y'all remember the old Papasan chair? The little circle and the big bowl? Oh, yeah. Papasan. Papasan? Excuse me. Okay, Sarah. We remember that, right? So we bought it. And we achieved comfort. And in my house, when I came in my house, that was my chair. 
Now, Biggie could sit with me. But that was my chair. One day I came in and found my ex-brother-in-law sitting in my chair. I'd been out splitting wood. He's sitting in my chair with a glass of tea. The ice had already melted and went down and his two daughters sitting on the floor crying. One of them needed changing. I had to literally go to the store and buy some ice so if I could have some tea because Vicky had fixed a, fixed a pitcher of tea. And then he turned around and looked at my wife and he said, Vicky fixed me a glass of tea. Mm. Oh. Y'all know he didn't sit in my chair again after that. <laughs> Matter of fact, he didn't sit in my house very many times. Why? Because those <laughs> possessions My wife was important to me. Are we getting the picture? The precedence that we put on this, this, this earthly life that we have, we can't understand, ladies and gentlemen. The life is not here. The life is there. And we're not willing to give up what we're doing wrong. We're not willing to give up things that, that would help us to attain that Christian eternal life. We, want to, we don't want to cut it loose. Ladies and gentlemen, Scripture says that if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Because he said it's better for you to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with both of them. If your hand offends you, cut it off. It's better for you to go to heaven maimed than to go to hell whole. Oh. This is Jesus talking. Ladies and gentlemen, listen. There's some habits that we need to lose that could cost us heaven. Why? Because they're, they're wrong before God. There are sins in this world that literally can cost us heaven. But we're not repenting. Because we're afraid of what it's going to cost us. Do you understand? You're getting the point? We're afraid of what it's going to cost us here. Not there. We've got relationships with people, with friends that we don't need. But we're afraid to cut them loose for the honor and glory of God when we know that every time we get with them, we stumble. We're afraid to stand up for God. Man, I wish Satan was put in his cage this morning. I hear this thing blipping over and over and over. We've got one chance on this side of eternity to get it right. But yet we're like the rich young ruler. We're comfortable in our sin. We're comfortable in our flesh. We're comfortable drawing that boundary with God and not going any further. Why? I know God. Well, he knew God. Remember when we talked about the first thing? Listen, he recognized Jesus and ran to him and he kneeled. Why? Because he knew. He knew. He knew the one.
What do we do? Some of them suffer from narcissism. Do we understand what narcissism is? Narcissism is that person that will never acknowledge that they are wrong about anything. Never wrong. Good word. Yes. Seriously. Now, guys, for fun, we used to have a plaque on my on my wall at the house. Now, I don't want y'all to think bad about Vicky, but it had this picture. It says, it said, had my picture. It said, Mr. Right. <laughs> And then it had Vicky's picture and said, Miss Never Wrong. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. We, we had a fun one at the house. But in truth, how many people do you know that are narcissists? They're never wrong. They will never acknowledge their sin. They're not empathetic. They, they are in a relationship with you, and all they, they want you for is what they can get from you. Guess what? We're narcissists when it comes to God. When it comes to God, we become sufferers of narcissism. We want the blessing of God, but we don't want the cross of God. Amen. We don't want it. It can't cost us anything. We need these blessings. We need to achieve more blessings. Why? Because I want everybody to see how good I am and see my blessings. My blessing's bigger than your blessing. You don't believe me? Go to the lake and look at the campers in the campground. Hey, I got this 25-footer and I got it for this much money. Well, you know, that's pretty good, man, but this 40-footer over here I got. You know, my Ford truck cost me $250,000. And I'm looking like, what moron pays $250,000? <laughs> yeah, I, I drove all these years. I, I drove this truck all these years, and I never had a wreck. And I'm looking at him, well, I drove this wreck all these years, and I ain't never had a truck. <laughs> Kind of funny, ain't it? <laughs> but literally, we're narcissists when it comes to God. It's never our fault. It's always somebody else's fault. No, we're not going to take, we're not going to acknowledge, and we're not going to take responsibility for our wrongs. You know, you know how you know it? Because there's never repentance right here at these altars. You can't tell me that in a week's time, 80 people ain't got something to repent of on Sunday when they get here. But we're not going to go there. We're going to draw that boundary with God. We're not going to go there. Why? Because we are comfortable in our sin. Here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. We're lacking pursuit of God. We're lacking the pursuit, the true pursuit of God the Father. And what happens is the great falling away that it talks about in Thessalonians. We've got too many other things to think about. We got TV shows. We got bass tournaments, and I'm guilty. We got football. We got fall ball. We got we got sports. We got what else we got? Hunting. Well, you know, we always make these excuses. Well, I have to work on Saturday. Sunday's the only day I got off. Okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah. T tell me that again. Sunday ain't the only day you got off, because if it is, you're looking for another job. <laughs> Don't lie to me. You know, you're looking for another job. You ain't going to work six days a week. Only the Jews do that. Boy, I figured that would get somebody. That just went right over your head. Literally. You know, this is kind of hitting home with people. There, there's very few amens in here, and there's a lot of people going, and you're laughing. Why? Because the truth hurts. You know, also, the truth's kind of funny, isn't it? The funniest things in life are the natural truth, true things that happen to people. But this rich young ruler acknowledged God. He acknowledged Him. 
He kept the commandments. And Jesus told him, you're still wrong, buddy. You're pursuing church. You're not pursuing me because if you were pursuing me and you had faith and trust in me, I've already promised you that I would supply every need you have according to my riches and glory. I have cattle on a thousand hills. I can heal you. I can provide for you. As a matter of fact, your breath is mine. We're not going there. We've got the game of Christianity going. The game of life. The game of monopoly. Every time we pass go, we hold out, God, give me a blessing. I need that blessing so I can spend it on things that I desire. What? To enrich my comfort in this life. Yeah, that's right. But when it comes to God, God, I don't need you right now. Things are going good. God's a great doctor. He's a lawyer. But he's not a bellhop. He's a servant. But he's a king. You know, we had the men's fellowship this weekend, and I guess I'm the most poor planner on the face of the planet because the last three years it has literally rained all over us when we go on the bow hunting trip. But let me tell you exactly what happened. So I felt like it was going to rain, so I got in my, my, my camper, and I bowed down, Father, I know we need the rain, I just need a favor. Send the rain from midnight to four o'clock. But let us have dry so we can congregate and we can fellowship and we can cook. I forgot to say hunt. <laughs> Y'all know what happened? God dried the rain. So we could cook. We could fellowship. We could congregate around the fire. We didn't have a raindrop on us. Every time we went hunting, it poured down rain. I didn't have a one dry shirt left to put on Saturday. Or Friday, excuse me, Friday. But Friday at noon, I got to go get on a stand, and I was there for three or four hours, seen a spike. Lots of people saw deer. And at night, it rained. It rained every night. Saturday morning we get up. It's supposed to be storming by 4 a.m. Friday night when I go to sleep, I say, Lord, please give us time to either cook breakfast in the morning and load up and get out of here without it being pouring down rain. We loaded up in the dry Saturday morning. All except for Connor and Andrew. Oh, yeah. Connor and Andrew. And so what do we do? We're dummies. We got out there with, with chicken, just like a chicken that ain't got sense enough to get in and out of the rain. We're out there helping them put their stuff up in the rain, get them settled. But we had a great trip. Friday night, we had a young man speak about selling out to God, being totally sold out to God. He gave a word. You see, 
We're going to have to make it up in our minds one day to quit playing games with God. We're going to have to understand that this life that we live here on earth, it can't compare to the life that we're headed to. We're going to have to figure that out. But as long as we're in the state of mind, that I love where I'm at. We're never going to get there. We're going to go away grieved. Notice that. Last verse. And he was sad at that saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. You know the one thing that I found out about great possessions? Is they require great maintenance. Did you ever notice that? The more you got, the more you have to take care of, the more you tend to. If you got two pairs of blue jeans, guess what? You're going to have to wash one pair. But if you got one, you just wear them all the time. Right? We got more responsibility than we need. What is our responsibility, ladies and gentlemen? Let's finish up. Some of us are not living the life that God desires us to live. It's that simple. And here's the thing. Some of us are doing it in church and some of us are doing it out of church. But the root of the problem is there's not a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's not a vibrant relationship. There is one that has been closed off because we chose a different path in our walk with God. And we know who He is. We know what He requires because it's stated in, in here in Genesis to Revelations. It's, we're not ignorant. It's there. But we've got great possessions. We've got great friends. We've got a nice house. We've got a good job. We've got a good paycheck. We've been able, with that paycheck, to buy lots of nice toys. We also have this possession of prestige. People know who I am and they love me. Right? What we lack is exactly what Jesus told this, this rich young ruler. You lack a relationship with me. And ladies and gentlemen, that's not saving faith. That will send you to hell. Why? Because you're not willing to part with this thing, the things that pertain to this world and follow God. You're not willing to do it. And our days are numbered. Our days are numbered. We can talk about the rapture of the church, but guess what? Don't worry about the rapture of the church. When it happens, it's going to happen. You need to worry about tomorrow because none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are guaranteed this afternoon. 
others. Don't worry about the rapture. Don't worry about what's happening in Israel over there. Guess what? What's going to happen is what God says is going to happen. I guarantee you that. It's not going to change. What God said in this book is going to happen. It hasn't missed yet. And it's not going to. But today, we're still playing games. We're choosing the world over God. And that is a very dangerous place to live. Very dangerous. The scripture says when Jesus returns or when death comes upon us, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do y'all know what gnashing of teeth is? It's when you grit your teeth. How many of you been doing something you're not supposed to be doing? And you slipped up there and you're doing this? And you got your hand in the cookie jar? And you hear somebody behind you go, I told you to stay out there! <laughs> you grit them teeth going, oh! And you know a whooping's coming. <laughs> That's what gnashing of teeth is. Is you got caught. Now let me explain something. I've been a pastor for 21 years. I've just, I've just literally been privileged. And God hadn't thrown me away yet because I'm probably not worth it. Larry, would you mind? Let's move this back a little further. Caitlin, y'all come on. Yeah, let's move it back here. Thank you, sir. Let me tell you the truth about it. Approached by parents. Brother Scotty, I was given your name by Ashby Funeral Home. They said you speak pretty good at funerals. I said, I don't know about that. Well, our son was killed. He was the young man that was 16 that got in the car with a drunk man and they run through the other end of the funeral home. And it killed my son. What do you think his last thoughts were when he saw the wall in that building coming? I've been in hospital rooms, ladies and gentlemen, where death was imminent. And you know what's odd? I talked to my loving son about this last night. It's, just, it's so good to have him home. But we were talking about the, 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 the way they administer medications at that time. They're trying basically to ease, ease the process of death. And so they come in and, and, and they give you shots of, of, of different medications to ease that process because your death is imminent. You're not coming back. They, they know. I've been in rooms, ladies and gentlemen, where a man was lying in that bed and they gave him all the morphine they could give him mixed with something else. He's out of it to one, one moment. And he lifts his head and his eyes pop wide open and he's going like this. And he says, no. Why? Because it wasn't God and the Spirit standing at the foot of his bed. And that's the truth. He saw through the veil and knew he was dying, and he knew his death was in a moment's notice. And guess what? The spirit he saw 
to come collect his soul was not God. Now, I personally couldn't see it. But he saw it as plain as day. Knowing things like this, ladies and gentlemen, why are we still holding on to possessions? Why are we still drawing boundaries? Why are we still holding on to the things of our flesh for comfort when God is the source of our joy, our comfort, our peace, our love, our blessing? Why are we still doing this? Why? Because we're afraid. To step out in faith. Faith is believing without seeing, ladies and gentlemen. Brothers and sisters, you can't taste God until you drop it all away. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell this rich young ruler. You can't do it with that. You got to drop all of it. Take those things that distract you and remove them so you can taste the good. So you can live life to the fullest. The thief cometh not before to kill, to steal, and to destroy. I come to give you life and give it to you in abundance. But yet you're going to hold on to your career. You're going to hold on to the things that give you comfort. That give you a, a false sense of security. It's going to cause you grief. Why? Because you know. You know. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end right here. You know. You know when it's Jesus talking to you. doubt. There's no doubt when Jesus speaks to you. It's the still small voice. Satan is the yeller. Satan's the one that hollers. Satan's the one trying and trying and trying to get your attention. Y'all ever notice something? It's not the big, big noises in the night that scare you? Why? Because you, you, you can actually figure out what those are. It's those real soft ones that really shake you up. That could be a spider walking across my pillow. Was that a mouse? Was that somebody sneaking up on me and turning my doorknob? Get them, Rowdy, get them! Oh, it's sneaky, going to the bathroom. Never mind. Jesus is the still small voice. And you know beyond a shadow of a doubt when he sleeps. He's, he's spoken today. And you've heard it. You heard it. He spoke through this loud mouth because I don't do I can't do this. This is God. I'm telling you right now, I'm too stupid to preach. God has to preach for me. But even while my mouth was going and God was presenting his truth, there was this Holy Spirit that was speaking to you in your heart. That's truth. The Holy Spirit spoke to you in your heart. You're either right or you're wrong. You're inadequate. Oh, I've been to church. It's not about that. I've kept the commandments. 
It's really not about that. That's just a schoolmaster, son. That's the schoolmaster to lead you to me. To lead you and to let you know that you have a need of me as a personal Savior. That's what those are. Are you saved? Do you want to inherit eternal life? Everything else away in your mind. The Lord said in 2 Chronicles 7 14, You shall seek me, and you shall find me, and you seek me with all of your heart. Guess what? Life changes. The abundance is what you begin to live with peace, contentment, joy, purpose. These, these should be full today. I'm going to clean them out. Ladies and gentlemen, where there's not room up here, then I pray I pray that we turn around to the chair. Don't let this moment pass you by. prayer in my heart is that you have been glorified. Father, I pray that today we've heard your word. But I pray more importantly, Lord, not only the hearing, but for courage to seek and find, to pursue, to let those things, Father God, that hinder us, that hold us back from truly knowing Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and our King, our Savior, our friend, our provider, our shepherd, our protector, Father, I pray those things fall by the wayside. And that today you are glorified. That, they, that today, that the name of Jesus is called upon. Father, let the journey begin. Father, let your truth ring out. Let your spirit speak. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for, for legions of your angels to surround this tent today, Father God, to, to eschew evil, to remove the demonic presence that could be here. As a matter of fact, we come into the, to the house of the strong man and we bind you in the name of Jesus Christ by the word of our testimony and by the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. And by the blood of Jesus, we, we command you, Satan, be gone from here. We command you to be gone. And we, we speak to those demons that are yours. And we say, be gone in the holy name of Jesus Christ. 
that we command you to depart. Father, we cry out to Elohim for the freedom of the Holy Spirit to spring forth in abundance and that your truth bring out mercy. Let mercy come running. Let grace run over. Let love abound. May your people ask for salvation today and repent. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, ladies and gentlemen.